Hi, my name is Daudi Mugabe and this is Business Mike episode 3. My guest today is a motivational speaker named Doreen Kanyasije. In this episode, Doreen shares the ups and downs of being a young motivational speaker, why she quit her job and how neuroplasticity can help you reconfigure your brain. All this and more next on Business Mike. Thank you, Doreen, for being here today. Thank you for having me, Daudi. Could you briefly tell us who you are and what it is that you do? My name is Doreen Kanye Sijakisache. I'm a lawyer by training. However, I'm doing full-time motivational speaking now. And do you have any business role models? Oh, yes, I do. There's this very lovely lady called Sarah Buckley. Okay. Sarah Buckley. She is the, the founder of Spanx. I don't know if you've heard about Spanx. No. Ask any lady about Spanx. Spanx are, you know, very, you know, comfortable undergarments for women. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm so passionate about this lady is because she had a dream. Yeah. And she pursued it. Okay. Right. Now, right from the time when she was a kid, her dad used to sit her down with her brother on the table and, she, and the dad would always ask her, what did you fail at today? Really? What failures did you have today? Right. So, in essence, her dad taught her about the importance of going out and pursuing what you want and in spite of the fact that you fail you should still persist and continue to pursue your dream and sarah took that lesson on and continued to pursue her dream and alongside <clears throat> her life she had a couple of failures in her life she wanted to become a lawyer that she failed at she had a business that she started and she still failed you know in that business however because of you know that passion that she had for her brand for the sparks spanks you know, product, she persisted and now she became the first self made lady billionaire. Oh, wow. Young lady billionaire in the whole of the world. So I'm very passionate and about her because she's the embodiment of persistence. She's the embodiment of having a dream and going for it in spite of the failures that you have and, you know, seeing it through. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's a really inspiring story. I'll, I'll check her out. Yes. Now, you said you're a motivational speaker. Yes. What people do you normally speak to and what is it that you speak about? So currently, my target group is basically, if we look at the age group, so it's basically people within the age bracket of 22 to 40. Mm -hmm. 22 to 40. And so we're also looking at mid-level management and lower level management and the youths. Okay. Right. So what I'm currently focusing on is issues to do with the neuroplasticity of the brain. Oh, what's that? So neuroplasticity, well, as the word does say, neuro, meaning the neurons in your head. Yeah. Then plasticity, meaning plastic. So it's basically how can we use the neuroplasticity of the brain? How can we use the, the conforming, malleable ability of the brain to better our lives? I tell you what, right, right before the 1980s, you know, neuroscientists used to think that our brains were mainly formed when we were little kids. Mm -hmm. And so after, after, after that age, age, age bracket, they thought that round about that time, your brain was very, very much formed and there's no way you could actually attain any new habits or become a different person, you know. But currently the research now indicates that no, that is not the truth. You can actually conform your brain to anything that you want. You know, say there's a particular habit you want to break. Uh -huh. You have that ability as Daudi. Yeah. So you do that by, it's a whole, do you want to go through that? Um, maybe just a brief, brief overview. Say I'm a smoker, for instance, yes. and I want to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. How would you, or how does this neuroplasticity help me quit? So I'll tell you how, how the brain forms a habit. In our brains, we have what we call neurons. Now, these neurons are information centers. They are what process the information that we transmit to our brain. So if you, if you say something, if I tell you, hi, Daudi, so the neuron has to take that in and process what I've just told you, the how are you, Daudi, and connect to the relevant parts of the brain and your body that are needed to process that information and to enable you to relay the right information or to do the right, to if, enforce the right command in order for you to actually affect what you've been told. So when you smoke a cigarette, there's a neural pathway. The neurons that are responsible for forming behavior, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's a couple of them. So smoking a cigarette and becoming a smoker is a behavior. So in order for you to form that behavior, one neuron has to fire with another. So what do I mean by firing with another? They have to transmit, transmit that behavior information to another neuron. Yeah. And when that happens, they form what they call a neural pathway. Oh, okay. A neural pathway, you can compare it to, say, picture a very plain field, a very plain green field. Uh -huh. yeah? Let's say that at the other end of the field, there's a house where you want to get to. Uh -huh. But for you to get to that house, it's very tedious for you to go around the field and get to that house. So you say, hmm, how about I just go through the middle of this, of this field to get to the house? So the more you get to that house, the more you walk on that particular path, the more you actually create a path, a beaten path on that field to get to that house. That is if you get to the, you go to the house every single day or every other two days. Yeah. So the same with our brains. Yes. In order for a brain to form a behavior, you have to do it over and over again. Right. So the more you smoke a cigar, mm -hmm. the more you create a very definite inroad between two neurons that then create a neural pathway and that neural pathway signifies a behavior. We get it now. So how do you then stop smoking? Now many people think that in order for you to break a bad habit, you have to, to get rid of that bad habit. In essence, you have to say, I'm not a smoker, I'm not a smoker, I have to get rid of this bad habit. No, what you have to do is create another positive habit. Right? So every time you feel like smoking, you have to figure out what else you're going to do. Uh -huh. Right? What else are you going to do in order for you to beat that strong need to smoke? Yeah. So you need to create that habit. Right. So it's either reading a novel, yeah. or you go cycling, right. or you call up a friend, or you, whatever it is, whatever other counter habit you can actually create. So when you build that new habit, which is then strong enough to contend with this old one, yeah. Neuro, uh, neuroscientists have what they call, they have a saying that goes, like, if whatever, fi whatever, whatever neuron fires together, uh -huh. we wire together, yeah? Or if you use it, if you don't use it, you'll lose it, right? So the more you enforce this other stronger pathway, right, the more this older pathway dies off. Okay. You get it. So if I'm to imagine it, let's yeah. say house one is the field, mm -hmm. there's no path but I keep going to the field by walking on the grass, so the grass gets stamped and yes. creates a path, and I'm just so used to that path. Mm -hmm. I need then to create a new habit where I have to create a new path yes. that I keep stamping on until there's yes. a new path. But yes. while I'm doing that, the grass is growing on this side. Yes, the so, grass is growing on this side. Yeah. You can compare it to people who go to the gym will, will associate with this. If you're building, if you're building a particular muscle in yeah. a gym, yeah. Right? And say you go for about three, four, five months without building that particular muscle. Yeah. The muscle atrophies. Right? right? It, it, it loses its yeah. strength. Yeah. The same for the neural pathway. So the less you use it, the more it actually fades and the less hold it has on your life. Right. How does that translate to you increasing your productivity as a person, to you having a happier life? How does it translate to to people becoming more productive in their companies and all. So obviously we know that, it, that the habits that we build as people, the habits that you as Dawoodi has built, yeah. predetermine the kind of output you have, mm -hmm. right? So if you have a habit of checking Facebook most of the time, yeah. if you have a habit of uh, leaving work early or complaining, or you're given an assignment and you don't complete it on time, that's a habit you've actually built. Yeah. So it's imperative that you actually identify what habits have you put in place that are not supporting you in achieving whatever goal you want to achieve. So identify those habits. That's step number one. So then what other habits can you actually create that are very pertinent to you achieving your goal? So you have to be very clear on those two you know, particular habits. Yeah. So then when, you, when you're very clear on those habits, when this habit surfaces itself and it wants to manifest itself through you, you then know that, okay, here it comes. So then I have to counter that with this other stronger yeah. habit yeah. that will enable me to achieve this particular goal that I have to achieve. Yes. Okay. Well, that's, that's very, very, very interesting stuff. Yes. W what inspired you to get into this whole motivational speaking thing? Why? Because you said you're a lawyer by trade. Yes. yes. Uh, 
is this something you do on the side? Do you do the both together? What, what inspired you? So I'm doing it full time. I'm doing it full time now. Pretty much passion, Dawoodi. Yeah. Passion. Right from Namagunga, that's why I went to in high school. I used to, I was, I was the interact president there. So then I was charged with the duty of coming up with topics to inspire the girls, blah, blah, blah. So I used to involve myself a lot in such. So it's things to do with self-esteem. How can yeah. we build our, self, our self-esteem as, as, as human beings and all? So then that, trans, that went on till campus. I was a cell leader, so I still had a couple of people who would come to my room and would talk about, you know, the same issues. How can you overcome this? Blah, blah, blah. So I had this passion, but I didn't know what to call it. I told myself, you know what, I don't want to be a, a counselor. How can I actually translate this passion to actually help me monetize and, you know, become, yeah. you know, prosperous? Then I went for my master's in, in, at, at Warwick University in the UK. Mm-hmm. That was the eye-opener right there. Mm-hmm. So I started watching a lot of, you know, uh, YouTube videos, going to events and all, and then I learned that these people are actually making a ton of money from doing what I love, and they're called motivational speakers, personal development consultants, and I thought, why not? Why don't I go back home? My plan was come back home, work as a lawyer for 10 years, retire, and then do motivational speaking, right? So how did I get the idea? How did I start? It was pretty much that innate feeling you know, that innate desire that I could just not bottle up that, you know, kept bidding me to rise up and, you know, pursue my dream and, you know, go for it. So when I came back, I worked for a bank as their legal advisor for about three months. And, and you know, that passion was just so strong within me. And I thought, you know what, I need to resign and pursue my dream. However, it was very difficult then to resign because I wasn't married by then. And we were going through a very, very difficult time at my home at that particular time, very little money. So it was pretty much, you know, my family kind of like dependent on me. Right. Yeah. But there's something about that thing that pushes you and you just cannot sit on, on you, you can't drown out that voice. You know, I, I tried, I thought, because I talked to a couple of friends and they told me, Dorina, are you stupid? Your family needs you now. They need the money, blah, 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 blah. And I told myself, you know what? Yes, they're right. They actually need the money. So I kept on working because I should have quit like the first month or the second month. I pushed it right to the third month, you know. But I had to listen to that inner voice. Wait, you worked for three months? Three months. After you came back, it was three months yes. before you quit? Yes, three months before I quit, yes. So, so yes, so I finally listened to the voice and I quit. Very difficult decision to make. My parents were not so happy with me. Friends thought I was mad. Actually, some of them said, Doreen is, is usually bright and brilliant, but now she's acting very stupid. I don't know what the hell is wrong with her. You know, but I had to listen to that inner voice to, again, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, I look up to her a lot as well. Mm-hmm. She said that one of the main things that we as people need to adopt is the ability to listen to that inner person. Drown out every other voice and just stay in tune with that inner person, that inner guidance system, who I believe personally is God, and that other person that he puts in you, which is you, there's you and God in there, you know. So tune in to that thing, to that God, to that you, and just, you know, walk on that unbeaten path. Because I love to tell people that if, 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 if all we do is conform, who will help advance society? You know, who will come up with ideas that will help society? You know, Sarah, Sarah Ber- Ber- Berkeley, you know, I mean, she talked to a couple of friends, and these were, these were very well-meaning friends. But are you serious? That cannot work. You know, and talk to any woman now about spanks. It's like, it's, it's a godsend. What? Spanks? You know, we can't do without them now when you're wearing a very nice dress or you just cannot do without them if you need them. So it's how can we then tune into that inner person and really follow that unbeaten path and, you know, advance society and, you know, achieve our dreams and leave a legacy, you know, that will help the generations to come. Yes. Now, at the beginning when you quit your job, you had a vision to start this motivational speaking venture. Yes. You've obviously been doing it for some time now. Yes. At that moment, you had a vision in your head. Yes. You had your, the places you were, the things you were doing. Yes. What were those things and what are you doing now? And are they different? And a whole why? lot different, I'll tell you. So, so um, if, if you, a guy like Tony Robbins, 
the, 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 the eighth motivational speaker is doing very well now. Tony Robbins started in this industry when he was about 24 years. And at 24 years, he, could com he still could command very large audiences. That's the thing about the Western society. It's not so much about your age. Right. What can you deliver? What can you present on the table? Mm -hmm. However, so I, I came back with the same notion. Oh, well, I'm, I, I have this vision. I have this passion. I mean, I may not have the, the, the tenure, you know, experience. career experience yeah. in, a, in, in, say, a multinational corporation. But that, that's, a, that, that's the same story with, with Les Brown. I don't know if you know him. He's doing exceedingly well. He commands up to about $10,000 an hour, Whoa. you know, for his speech. He didn't have, actually, I get my greatest inspiration as a motivational speaker from Les Brown. Mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't go to college. He didn't have any multinational career experience, but he's now doing that well because he's stuck it in and pursued his dream. So I thought, you know what? Let me do the same, come back and, you know, no, that was when I'd already come back. Right. So after the three months, I said to myself, you know what? I may have only you know, a very, very few years, ex very few months experience, but people will actually listen to me. So in my head then, I thought, hmm, within a year or two years, you know, I should be, say, traveling to, say, some African countries, not East Africa, but say, some African countries, you know, speaking to them, motivating them and all, you know. But little did I know that I still had a couple of years to actually get to, I'm not, I'm not yet there, going to African countries. East Africa, yes, but other African countries, not yet there, you know. So I thought I was going to become a very top-notch motivational speaker in Africa within, say, one or two years. But that is far from the truth because one of the things I did not do, one of the mistakes I actually made, oh, okay. uh -huh. you know, which I think could have helped me on the journey, you know, was understanding that, Yes, you will get an idea, yeah? But you need to be sure not to trans, not to think that what, what works in one culture will actually work in another culture, yeah, yeah. you know? You need to look at the cultures independently. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is working in America like this. How different is Uganda? Right. What is the business environment like in Uganda, mm -hmm. right? So my experience in Uganda has been that, you know what, if you're going to speak to a 60-year-old in Uganda, or to a 50-year-old, or to anyone who is older than you. It's very imperative that you partner, you go into very strategic partnerships with people who are within the same age bracket as that particular target audience that you want to target, you know, because they have the whole thing of you're young, what are you actually telling me and all, you know. So one of the things I did not do exceedingly well was not researching the market effectively you know, and coming up with strategies to actually, you know, counter that, which strategies should have been, which I'm doing now, is strategic partnerships, mm -hmm. you know. So because of that, I had a couple of failures. I've had a couple of failures on the way, say, going to companies and they give me um, a slot to speak to their top management, okay. you know. So as opposed to being aware that, you know what, let me partner, say, with this judge, with this person who has been in the industry for long, for them to actually come and present this topic first, mm -hmm. and I come in later. Right. You understand? Right. Yes. Because then they're already open to what you have to say. Yes. Okay, this person has already talked. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she's actually sub complimenting or supplementing mm -hmm. what this other older person has actually said. So with that, you know, I mean, that's what law firms do. You know, that's what law firms do. I mean, law firms will bring together a consortium of very talented individuals right. who have strength in this area, strength in this particular area, whether it's tax or what. So that's something I did not do to be able to market, to research the market effectively, to leverage on strategic partnerships. And so because of that, I'm not where I want to be now, mm -hmm. right? Not where I want to be now, and that's the, in terms of the international scene not there yet because I've actually said work partnering with other strategic partners as of this year. This one actually harnessed the lesson. Yes. Very, very interesting. So for anyone out there who's Ugandan or African that's, that wants to do what you're doing, motivational speaking, how do you look for these partners? Do you Google motivational speaker Uganda or Kenya, whatever? Do you get a contact inside companies and ask them who's spoken before, what's their contact? How do you find these so I'll people? I'll tell you, a company will come up with a need, has a particular need, which is what you actually want to address. So a company has a particular need, right? So what you've said is very, very fundamental. Within that company, there's a person who knows what exactly the company needs yeah. and how they, they want it delivered. A person who's very much familiar with the culture of that company 
who is very much familiar with the mindset of the people in that company, right? Which is what I've been doing. So I'll go to that particular person and I'll talk to them and ask, look here, here's what I want to do for you, yeah? Here's my proposal, yeah? Who do you think would be best to partner with now? Right. Right? So I've found that to be extremely useful because so they'll tell you, for instance, one of them told me about a certain professor who lives in Nairobi, right? So I had to go and hunt this professor down and tell him, look here, there's this proposal, his work that's, that's coming up, can we partner? And this professor was very much willing. And this is a guy who's actually done work with them. Right. So he then comes in, not as part of the company, but really as a strategic alliance. So then you go and talk to them, here's the work I have to do, who can I partner with? They give you an idea. But even then, if, if you cannot find anyone in that particular, you know, so obviously there's the internet, you just Google and find out which particular person is an authority in that area. And as long as it involves money, they are usually willing to partner with you. Right. Yeah. So they, they get a cut of whatever it is. Yes, yes. And usually more often than, than not, if it's a huge contract and they usually become the lead consultants. That's where the strategic alliance then comes in. So they become the lead consultants where they're, they, they're pretty much the face. Mm-hmm. If that company is, is dominated by old people, very experienced people, and it's, and it's a top management, they pretty much dominate the face of your company. Right? So they'll present those very fundamental you know, aspects of, of whatever they need. And then you come in to, you know, to cater to the motivation, to, to kind of like, you know, give the credibility. It's, it's, so then he's presented on a particular topic. How can you then take that topic and apply it in your own life? Then you bring in things like neuroplasticity, how you can actually use your brain to take this information that he's given you to make it a part of your life and all. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, um, those are some very interesting tips there. Now, obviously, you've had some good moments in your career. Can you tell us about some of the best ones? Some of the best ones were I was invited to Zimbabwe uh, for um, an ICJ conference to speak to the women there. Mm. And for me, that was extremely, extremely refreshing. And another very good moment I had was at Uganda Registration Services Bureau. I mean, that was one of the first gigs I got, by the way. That's why it, I, I can never forget it, you know. So it had been a couple of failures along the way. Oh, you're too young. You cannot talk to us. Oh, who's backing you? How much experience do you actually have? You know, so I finally got a gig with the Registration Services Bureau. And I spoke to the whole, all the staff right before that presentation. You know, you could actually tell that people's body language, yeah. you know, seated back and thinking, what does this little girl have to tell us? Blah, blah, blah. So... After the presentation during the Q&A session, it was so beautiful because an elderly lady put up her hand and said, my child, we're very sorry for putting you down, for not thinking that, for thinking that you, there's nothing you can actually avail to us. But us being here has actually been very, very refreshing. So that was a huge validation on my part. You know. And from then on, I mean, no obstacle is too huge because of the validation I got from all those elderly, you know, experienced people. Yes. So... Different people are in the field of motivational speaking, and in a society like ours where it's still new, more will come up. What is it about you and what you do that makes you stand out? How are you different from any other motivational speaker? I think, I don't know if this makes me very different, because I think most motivational speakers should be actually doing this. It's, it's the whole notion of one size fits all, mm-hmm. you know? So initially when I started out, I used to have a very, you know, very definite model speech that I was going to give, you know. So go to a company, speak about this, blah, blah, blah. But then I was quick to realize that the one-size-fits-all approach cannot work. You have to go into a company, research their needs, what do they need, what's the target audience like, what are their mindsets, and, and remodel the, the, the product or the speech to actually fit whatever you have to, you know, whatever you have to do. So... That's one thing that I focus on that I'm very pertinent to really focus on. It's the, the whole, you know, research their needs and make sure that what you have to deliver is very much in alignment with, you know, what you're actually delivering. Okay. Yes. And for anyone who is new to this whole public speaking thing, it's, it's a fear very many people have, actually. Yeah. I think it's number one above death even. <laughs> so, <Really? laughs> yes, it is. What basic tips can you give someone 
who's about to address an audience, be it at the office or at church or at a Toastmasters meeting, anything, any yes. tips? Yes, I think one of the main important tips I can give you is to build your inner person, say as Dawoodi. Build that inner person and believe in that inner person to the point where you know that you have something valuable to offer. So then there's really a fear. How can I, as Dawoodi, stand up and speak to this audience? What do I have to offer? Will they actually listen? You know, who am I? You know, look at them, they're all very qualified. You know, you have to come to that place where you tell yourself that you have something of value to offer. And when you believe in you, when you believe in your innate abilities, and you then have to also remember that the audience, as they say, is vying for you to do well because they actually want to benefit from what you have to actually deliver. No one wants to sit in a 30, 15 minute talk and not take away anything. So there's that. You believe that you have something of value to deliver. And then moving from that standpoint, from that pedestal to actually remember they are vying for you to do exceedingly well and then going ahead to deliver from your heart. Yes. And in your profession, before you go out to present, before you send any proposal, is there anything you look out for? What's the most important thing about your whole business? Yes. What's the key thing, the one ingredient you look out for the most? The quality of the product. And I'm still perfecting and you know, making that excellent. Quality of the product would obviously be the quality of the speech. You know? So it's imperative that I make sure that what I have to deliver does meet the needs of a target audience. You know, so yes, that's what I actually look out for, the quality of the product. Is it relatable? Do I have very relevant examples, exercises? Is it interactive? Gone are the days where it was, you know, so much about you standing up and speaking. Yeah. You know, these days it's so much about you facilitating. You know, how can you lead? Because if you ask me about something concerning your life, it's very probable that you already have an answer. Yes. You already have an answer. So it's very pertinent for me to then lead you through what you already know and you airing it out and I present my view, you present your view and then you as a party, you as the, you as the, the target person will then marry what I've told you and what you know in order for you to come up with a, a very effective you know, solution for whatever you're dealing with. Yes. So I look out for that. If you had an audience with your role models, you mentioned Les Brown and the founder of Spanx. If you had a one-on-one -on -one with each one of them and you were told that you can ask them any question, yes. what questions would you ask them? I'd ask them about their motivating factors. Mm -hmm. The main motivating factor. What's that thing, or what are those five, four, three, two things that keep them going when all hope seems lost? What's that thing that makes them get up when they've gotten the, the, the largest no, on the, or when they've made a very nasty presentation in spite of Les Brown being very... I'll tell you one thing. The time when Les Brown was going to make a presentation. Now, he'd been doing the whole motivational speaking for about 30 years then. So he was very much acclaimed in the industry, had, you know, the Fortune 500 companies under his belt, name it. But he was very apprehensive about this particular presentation. And so he went to a friend and told him, look here, I'm very apprehensive about this particular presentation. What can I do? You know, and all the friend told him was, you know what, think about your motivating factors. What's that thing that when you think about will push you to give your all, will push you to go forth any limitations, any thoughts of you not having the ability in order for you to actually deliver. So obviously on the, on the journey to us realizing our dreams, you know, you're, you're met with a lot of obstacles, failures, in spite of you as Dawoodi having the, the potential, you know. So... However, it's important to realize that it's, it's that thing that will enable you to get up and keep on going because you know that, you know what, it's not about the failures you get. It's about how persistent you are to actually get that yes that you're looking for. And it's just that one yes or that one podcast interview that you're going to do. It might not be now, maybe like another month or two years from now that will enable you to break out into the industry and you'll be known for that one podcast which then opens you up to another whole you know, industry. So it's really that motivating factor that keeps you going to get to that point where you get that major breakthrough. So I'd want to know that. Right. Yes. Okay. And um, if you were the host of this show, if the tables were turned and I was the guest and you're the host, uh -huh. what one question would you ask me? I'm not about your motivating factor. <laughs> I need to answer that. What motivates you as Dawoodi? Well, 
I've actually been asked this in my last interview. Yes. And I said it's simply happiness. Um, happiness. Yes. Because, actually, it's not happiness. I would say it's, it's knowing that I have less and less time. Yes. You see, whether I do something about it or not, the clock is ticking. Yes. So, either I do it or I don't, or I'm in the mood or I'm not, yeah. but I have to, because the clock is ticking. Because the clock is ticking. Yeah. That's the Steve Jobs mentality. That's what made him achieve so much. That's one question he always asked himself from the time he was 17 years. Yeah. What if today was my last day? Yeah. Would I be doing this or would I be doing it better? Yeah. So it's an excellent mentality to have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's, that's about it. Um, how can people get in touch with you? The website is mastermindalliance.co.ug uh-huh. and uh, email, email is doreen at mastermindalliance.co.ug. Okay. Yeah. I'll put all those on the show notes page so people can find them there in case they need to get in touch okay. with you. Thank you so much, Doreen, for your Thank time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to Business Mike today. And if you'd like to listen to more episodes just like this one, simply go to businessmike.com. For all the links and resources mentioned in this particular episode, simply type the name Doreen into the search bar to access the show notes page. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, take care.